Stefan Hamel today, someone I've known for a long time. He is a digital analytics and digital marketing consultant, an innovator, a teacher, a keynote speaker, and he has a strong interest in user privacy and the ethical use of data. We will add more about him in the session notes, as there is a lot. But for now, I'm just going to jump straight into it with, again, Stefan Hamel. Okay, so I know this because I've witnessed it. But for the past 20 years, you have been preaching for digital analytics excellence, which I must clarify is totally compatible with the greatest respect for people's privacy. And you have built best practices and developed tools that are very well known in the industry. So why now turn your attention towards privacy and ethics? Uh, I think there is there's uh, certainly a couple of reasons. Um, one is very personal. Uh, my data was leaked from a financial institution along with millions of other people. So we uh, basically you take the whole population of uh, the province of Quebec in Canada. Virtually everyone saw their data leaked. Um, and we were directed to a service that offers um, uh, identity theft uh, monitoring. Yeah. But when I turned to that service, I realized that on their website, uh, they were doing stuff that was, uh, let's say, it was questionable. <laughs> it was, um, you know, uh, so many tags on that site. It was, it was crazy. They had so many... Uh, ad related tags uh, and when you logged in into you, uh, you do the authentication and then you see all the details about your finance uh, how much you own uh, uh, the, the house the address where you live so much information of course all of your personal information date of birth uh, you know, all those things and the tracking was all there in that that very, very uh, specific section of the site. So I was very worried about that. I contacted their privacy officer, who essentially said, no, 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 everything is fine. Everything is illegal. Uh, everything is under control. Uh, we take your privacy very seriously. Oh, yeah, of course, that's always the first answer, right? <laughs> your privacy is very important for us. Oh, yeah. Um, so after a couple of attempts, uh, I decided to go public with that. And it ended up, uh, I ended up being uh, on radio, on TV, doing interviews and talking about the specific issues because so many people were affected by this uh, data leak. And by the way, the data leak was done by a digital uh, marketer at the financial institution. Yeah. Uh, so that, that kind of, you know, rings a bell. Uh, the other reason is um, when I started looking at privacy and ethics, um, of course, we all heard about Cambridge Analytica. And, uh, you know, one thing leading to another, I ended up going to the marketing festival uh, in Prague, where I met Christopher Wiley, the uh, whistleblower from Cambridge Analytica. And I spent a good 30 or 45 minutes in a very small room backstage, just the two of us most of the time. And we started chatting about so many things that I was, you know, it, it is it's a fascinating story. Uh, and in order to, to prepare for that, I watched uh, hours and hours of testimonials, uh, read everything I could, and I had you know, pretty, pretty good questions and he was really willing to, to you know, reveal everything, didn't hide anything. But I still had a couple of questions. And anyway, I, I ended up on stage in front of you know, like 1500 marketers in the room um, asking me a few questions, but the guy is absolutely like, he's a crazy guy. He's, he's super cool, but it's like you push a button and he, he, he goes and he talks and he talks and he talks. So I think I asked him three questions and that was it. <laughs> okay. And how was that audience with it? So I would imagine digital marketers wouldn't be yeah. the most receptive to denouncing excessive trucking. Yeah, they were, they were very receptive. And, and just before the interview, uh, I presented something like uh, the doomsday is upon us where I showed many examples where good intentions turned evil or where machine learning was done in a way that it, it didn't work and it was uh, 
it was scary. So some some of the peoples actually said that I, I scared the shit out of them <laughs> during my presentation because I revealed examples of what can happen when you're just a regular, maybe you're just a regular marketer. I asked the audience, if you could get your hands on 30 million profiles, rich profiles, and you are tasked with a team of data scientists, you are tasked to sell something to an audience. What are, are you going to say no? Of course, everyone wants to do that. Every marketer, every analyst would dream of working with a lot of data like this. And that's essentially what Cambridge Analytica was doing, except instead of selling you know, T-shirts and chocolate bars and stuff, uh, they were just selling a, an election candidate. Okay, and what do you think led to that? Did we slowly fall down a slippery slope of increasing disregard for people's privacy? Or was it something else? Um, I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning saying, oh, how can I be evil and, and you know, conquer the wealth? You know, there are cartoons that <laughs> do that. But it's just too easy to, to eventually, oh, the data is there. Oh, we, we have the tools to do it. Oh, we need to deliver results. We need to be super efficient in our marketing campaign. So it's probably okay. The tool allows me to do it. So why not? Um, but I think danger is, is when you realize that, uh, you know, the way, at least the way, I'm sure the way you learn about marketing also, at least that's what they tell us in school, is, you know, the traditional Philip Cutler. But the, the definition at, at the, at its core is about uh, exchange of value and building trust. But now it's like the, the scale is not balanced anymore. There is too much power on one side of the equation. And it, the, the relationship, the trust is being eroded also. Um, there are just so many data leaks and bad actors and, and things like that. So that, that equation makes... Uh, the, and, and, that's the realization I had about Cambridge Analytica is that marketing has always been about influence. But now when you think of it, you have uh, big data, you have machine learning, you have social media. So it becomes a lot easier to manipulate and deceive people into doing whatever you want them to do. Because you can be so efficient with your message that at the, at the end of the day, it, it's, it's like propaganda, it's, it's manipulation, and especially when you talk about election. So there's a great danger when so much power is in the hands of so few people at the end of the day. Yeah, I was thinking, since you mentioned that evolution of marketing, how technology has come to completely invade the marketing discipline to the point that the engineering mindset so detached from the emotional element of persuading people, building brands, etc. Well, that technical mindset is not at ease with the complexities of the mind that it cannot measure in a simple way. And could that invasion, so to speak, be the reason behind this search for extreme rationality in an environment that was never meant for it and therefore a race to collect more and more data points without much sense. And but putting that crazy thought aside for a second, we seem to have ended up in a place where legal compliance or some sort of belief in, in compliance as a binary reality justifies all sorts of practices. What do you think about this? Well, the, the, the interesting point about being legally compliant versus looking at ethics is that you can be compliant from a legal standpoint, but what you do can still be unethical. And that's the game that is being played on right now with the constraints that things like GDPR are, are you know, putting in place and everything. The MarTech, AdTech vendors are obviously trying to stay compliant, <clears throat> but in doing so, they are also pushing the limits to the very, very thin line where they are still legally compliant, but what they are doing is not very ethical. You know, it, it's, it's not, you would ask a, a, a normal person on the street, 
if this is right or wrong. And most likely they would say, I don't like that. I don't like the way it's going. And that's my worry is that, of course, there, there are some players that will go belly up and they won't survive the change. But most of the other ones, they are working very, very hard to uh, find creative ways to still be legally compliant, but push it so far that eventually, you know, it, it, it's bound to create uh, ethical yeah. issues. Is that how you came up with your no consent, no trucking? Sort of yeah, thing? yeah. And it's a bit, uh, most people, especially in my network, when I talk about that, they don't always agree, which is perfectly fine. But after looking at, at you know, making my own uh, path and thinking about it, what I realized is that when someone comes to your site, if you ask them, do you want to be tracked? They will say yes or no. They, they, they won't go as far as thinking, oh yeah, am I going to be tracked for analytics purposes or for remarketing purposes or for this or for that? They, it's a simple answer. I don't want to be tracked or I want to be tracked. And then you have all those, those um, you know, sneaky kind of workarounds where, oh, we're not using cookies. So we don't have to ask for consent, which is wrong by the way. Um, or, uh, you know, we, uh, we do it out of legitimate purpose. So uh, we don't have to ask for consent or such and such vendor uh, claim to be GDPR compliant and claim that you don't have to ask for consent. So therefore, we're going to track the hell out of our visitors as much as we can without revealing because legally we don't have to. Does it mean that it's right? I don't think so. So, so that, that's why for me, if someone comes to the site and you ask, do you want to be tracked? When they say no, it means no. It doesn't mean no but or no if or no, it, no is no. It, it, it's super simple. And, and when you start to think in this way, the, one of the big problem with GDPR is, is that each of the local jurisdictions have slightly different rules. Uh, can you use implied consent when they scroll or when they continue to visit or what if you use cookies or you don't use cookies or what if you use fingerprinting or, you know, it, it makes, it's a mess. Um, and, and I think that the best demonstration of that is uh, when you get about 50 of the top analysts that I know, uh, at a, a conference called Super Week. Yes, I've heard great things about it. Oh, it's a, it's, it's a great event. It's, it's really, because you, you essentially think of it as, you know, the movie, The Shining. <laughs> you have an hotel that looks a little bit like that on a mountain top. You cannot go anywhere, uh, but you essentially get locked down in a hotel um, for five days with a bunch of nerds of analytics. Yeah. And so, so you get, you know, very interesting conversations. So one of the discussion point was um, you, you end up at the end of the day with about 50 people talking about privacy and ethics and so on. And I asked a very simple question. If you use Google Analytics um, and you say anonymize IP, you don't do remarketing and you use a feature that doesn't need to use cookies, do you still need consent? Do you still, is it GDPR compliant first? Uh, is it okay to do that from an ethical standpoint? And it went crazy. Like we couldn't agree with a, you know, a scenario like that. Is it okay or is it not? So to me, if, you, if we couldn't figure it out, I can't imagine someone, a marketer or an analyst, you know, working anywhere who, who has to deal with all those exceptions and wondering if it's, it's right or not and, and so on. So let's simplify the whole thing yeah. and be super transparent, uh, privacy by design. And, and when it's no, it's no. So if I were to ask no or yes, mm -hmm. who would ever say yes to being tracked? Uh, that's general. a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and um, uh, you, you talk about that also when you 
when you talk about uh, zero data, yes, uh, right? zero party data, um, it, it, it's about trust. It's about building a relationship. It's about exchanging value. So there, even if I use a Brave and I block uh, all the ad networks that I can, um, you know, I, I'm very conscious of, of the data collection going on and so on. There are some sites where I say, yeah, sure, I'm willing to offer you a piece of my privacy, even if they claim that it's all anonymized and it's armless, but I'm willing to you know, open up because I see the value, I trust them, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, and another word that you tend to use a lot lately together with trust is trust. And I really like how you use that as it reflects pretty well the manner in which data is created as a sort of debris, which could be another name, resulting from the interaction between people and digital assets, which by itself sounds pretty innocent. Exactly. You leave, you leave, you leave small traces behind, a little dust behind you. And of itself, the dust itself is, is harmless. It, it doesn't have any value. But when you accumulate enough dust, <laughs> then you can do something with it. Um, one of the parallel I do is um, think of your DNA. Your DNA represents you, your unique you. And it has all the attributes that, that makes you unique. And uh, typically we, you know, we don't give our DNA anywhere. You know, we, we are very careful because we understand the consequence of the possibilities that can, you know, all the things that can be done with DNA. Um, but in itself, DNA alone is not very useful. It becomes useful when it's combined with all the other people's DNA and you can create relationships. So the parallel I do is, is that uh, the, that dust, uh, digital dust that you leave behind is like your DNA. It represents you and you only, even if it's anonymized. You know, the way I put it is, in the death of uh, the big data swamp of an ad network, there's a unique combination, a unique DNA sequence that represents you, even if it's anonymized. And the danger is that eventually it becomes non-anonymized because it's, it's used in a different way or it's combined with some, something else. And, and we, oftentimes we don't suspect how the data being collected today is going to be used in the future. And they, they, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, a classic work that has been done to demonstrate how you could use the zip code, the age and gender to identify people in the States. The data was supposed to be anonymized and yet someone found a way to de-anonymize it. And, and just more recently in August, I think Mozilla came out with a research that was initially done, I think in 2012, but essentially what they did is they, they, they made the demonstration that if you take the top 150 websites that someone's visit, and we tend to always visit the same sites, you take those sites, and you can reconstruct the user ID of that unique person only based on the browsing history, nothing else. No cookies, no nothing, just the browsing history uh, in, I think, over 80% of the time. Okay, so just, just to start wrapping it up, where will you take this next? What's your mission? One, one of the mission is, is uh, I think, and I'm certainly not alone in, in that, going in that direction, but uh, we need more resources and education and more awareness of what it entails to be privacy conscious. Um, we need education that is, is not uh, legally oriented because uh, it, it's hard to read, it's hard to understand. There are so many exceptions and so on. So we need simple scenarios that we can relate to and say under those conditions, this is what we recommend from an ethical standpoint. And, and usually ethics are above the law. You know, you, you go further than, than what the law requires. At least that's the way I, I see it. So that's, that's one aspect that I want to develop. And, and while I'm doing that, I, you know, at one point I created a Google Drive document that I opened for anyone to, 
comment and you know uh, put their uh, feedback and, and so on and I was uh, really amazed by the level of participation in that uh, so that was great so I'm taking notes uh, I wouldn't say that I don't dare to say that I will write a book <laughs> because I've been saying it for 10 years, <laughs> but I'm taking a lot of notes. <laughs> so who knows what's going to happen. But, uh, you know, for me, it's working with, with my clients uh, or even agencies because I, I, I do, I coach agencies also. Uh, but, uh, you know, making sure that, that there's an increased awareness of how we can still do our job, but be conscious and use data in a fair way for the benefits of our users and ultimately the benefits of the company we work with. Well, I think you're in a very interesting spot. We could argue that marketing departments have really lost track of what really means to be customer centric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we keep talking about customer centricity and yet every single business keeps building yet another repository with yet another copy of who you are <laughs> and searching for that mm -hmm. 360 view. Yeah. So I guess you could help marketers really become customer centric through data ethics. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that, thank you. Um, and, and, you know, in a way, claiming to be customer centric is, <laughs> I, would, I would dare to say that it's, it's almost the same as when a company answers you saying, your privacy is very important for us, right? It, it's, it's as, it doesn't have a real meaning when it's just a statement that you put out there, but you don't really, really believe it. Uh, so I think that's where we need to work. Uh, the combination, the intersection of uh, marketing, technology, and legal it is pretty hard to, to put together because you, you get people who understand the legal aspect, but they don't always understand the technical or even the marketing aspect and so on. Uh, so it, it's finding the right balance and the way to make sense of that. Uh, I think that's the real challenge. Very good. So any books or any readings that you may recommend until you write your own? <laughs> One of the, I, I, um, I completed the IAPP uh, training for GDPR and there's a, you know, a big book that comes with that. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, no, it, it, I would say it's a good book in the sense that it, at least it has some uh, good examples and, and, you know, kind of case studies and stuff like that. Yeah. It's not just a dry legal document. It, it has some real application. So that's a, that's a good thing. Well, I did happen to interview Eduardo Staran here a few months ago, as he's the editor of that uh, European Data Protection Law and Practice Manual. Anything else? Um, well, I, of course, I read a lot of, uh, and, and sadly, a lot of what I read is about data leaks and privacy issues and stuff like that. Uh, so it's it's nice to read about that because it, in a way, it helps you understand even more the implications and the importance of doing it right. <laughs> well, thank you, Stefan. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, it was it's always a pleasure, and I look forward to see you in in. Real flesh. <laughs> so do I. You can find more about Stefan and a few episode notes at mastersofprivacy.com. Thank you. <laughs>